this really interesting question of what if the facts are facts, but they are against the liberal ideological project. And I think this is this is another place, Glenn, where you end up getting into into hot water with folks. One example of this was it wasn't you personally, Glenn, but Lee Fong's reporting. Well, he did a video interview with a black guy, I believe in the suburb, suburbs of LA or out just outside of um, the LA. In San Francisco. In San Francisco. Like, Sorry. Oakland. Okay. Um, who said that he was supportive in some respects for the Black Lives Matter movement, but he thought that some of the protests that resulted in property damage were a problem. You know, I'm well, no, he, he just, just to be clear, like he yeah. was a protester marching in, mm. in the Black Lives mm. Matter March mm-hmm. and Lee interviewed 10 people, one of mm-hmm. whom was him. He was mm-hmm. like a um, a mixed race kid um, who essentially is black. And what he said was, I'm really angry when black people are killed unjustly by white police officers. Right. But I'm also angry, equally angry when my black neighbors are killed by other black people. And it seems like the media only cares and the public only cares when a white police officer kills us, but not when black criminals kill us. And if black lives matter, why don't they care in all cases? That was not Lee's argument. That was right. this, that was this kid ki- who this he interviews argument. argument. So a lot of people got really mad at the substance of what that guy said. And I think there are a lot of really healthy, robust arguments against the black people don't care about black on black crime stuff. Mostly is that the media doesn't pay attention to black protests against violence in black communities. And I think that's really a fair criticism to make of the kid. What was interesting was how much criticism was put on Lee for putting up that in- interview as one of a series of interviews of people with a whole bunch of diverse opinions and attributing that opinion to him as though Lee was intentionally trying to participate in the bigger right-wing cultural argument that says we shouldn't have to care about Black Lives Matter because there's also Black on Black crime. This is this is some cancelable stuff coming from me now, but this this is this is something that I think is really interesting because it's not that, that what that kid said was true or that I agree with it, but there is, I think, sometimes a real a, an overinvestment, more of an investment in making sure that the narrative stays correct. A narrative that I agree with, the politics that I agree with, then allowing divergent views to be aired. And I think it's important for divergent views to be aired so that we know what we're dealing with and we know what arguments to make so we're not caught off guard when Eric Adams wins as mayor of New York, right? But you see that not just in that Lee Fong instance, you know, it's, it's when we have conversations, you know, the, here we go, sorry, here's, here's my last bit of cultural capital, the conversation about detransitioning, right? And to me, the analogy there um, is is whether or not you would want to say air or write articles about someone who had lied about rape. It, to me, these things are really analogous. Of course, the overwhelming thrust or like invented hate crimes, right? Those, right, same thing. The, right? the overwhelming thrust of, of of rape victims never get heard. They never report their crimes, and their crimes are never investigated. And obviously, the overwhelming political interest is behind correcting that incredible wrong. At the same time, when something does happen, like the Duke lacrosse case, is the obligation to pretend it doesn't, to, you know, to ignore it, um, to not to feed into a broader cultural stereotype that women lie about sexual assault. Do we, do, does Lee just bury that video because he doesn't want to feed into a larger cultural stereotype about black people not caring about black and black crime? What is the obligation, you know, does... Does does someone like Jesse Single not write about detransi- detransitioners because he doesn't want to b- to feed into the larger cultural pressures against trans people who find it very difficult to be heard by their families and communities who want to transition? And Nathan, I'm curious to know what you think about what the obligation of people in the media are to cover or not cover those kinds of issues in order to, you know, protect a political goal that I think that we all probably share. Glenn and I had, had another fight on Twitter, actually, about uh, 60 Minutes aired a segment on uh, detransitioners and uh, Glad put out a statement criticizing it. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of defended uh, Glad's what, what critique. What do you mean? Oh, oh I, did, I criticized Glad, you're saying. I criticized You Glad's criticized criticism. Glad, who had put out a statement right. criticizing uh, right. 60 Minutes, and then I right. critiqued you critiquing Glad. 
Um, right, right. <laughs> critique yeah. in 60 minutes. So right. um, the the critique that they had made essentially was by highlighting all these stories of people who regretted uh, changing their, their gender. Um, 60 Minutes was fueling a kind of narrative that like suggests that this is much more common than it is. Now, I am not of the school that suggests don't talk about things that could embarrass it. If I, if I, I have the entire opposite perspective, which is that you need to talk about them because otherwise people are you disagree with are going to bring up these things that you buried and frame them in a way that is very bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel the same way about the uh, like uh, the lab leak stuff with, uh, with, with COVID, where it's it's like don't don't pretend this didn't happen or isn't a possibility. Mm -hmm. Get ahead of it and and talk about it and and discuss it. Don't suppress stuff uh, that could have bad I implications. Um, however, I do think that there are important critiques uh, in terms of like being careful to frame things in ways that are not misleading. So one of the reasons a lot of trans people have objected to, for example, Jesse Singles' coverage is because they suggest that he puts too much emphasis on the detransitioners when there is a lot of work still to be done in highlighting the fact that people, most trans people don't get, in fact, get the care and help that they need. Do you think that's right? They are not, in fact, getting too much support and pressure. They are getting too little. We ran an article from someone in the UK who said that, uh, you know, the UK was has had this big court case about a woman who says she, she was uh, uh, pressured into changing her gender by an NHS clinic, um, but the writer for us was a, tra a, a trans woman from the UK who said my big problem was that I couldn't get seen by by this clinic and in fact I had to delay my transition far too long and that there's a lot of conversation in fact now it's fueling bills in all these states designed to roll back care for trans youth um, and so my belief is that like things should be presented proportionally not buried but that we should be careful about how these things are, are presented in order to not present a misleading picture. I would ag I would agree with that. I, I will say and I'm certainly no expert in this area and we should we should have people from various sides of this issue on to discuss it who have had more direct experience than any of us. But I do remember reading Jesse's article when it came out. And I remember it having a lot of the caveats that I talked about earlier building into articles to make sure that people understand that you're coming from a place of good faith. And I remember reading paragraphs and paragraphs of him saying that, of course, the overwhelming issue is that trans kids, trans young people aren't being heard out by their families, aren't being offered the support, mental health, medical, or otherwise, that they need in the moment, that there, there are a lot of dangers and risks of people self-harming because they're not able to get that support. And of course, that's the overwhelming concern. I remember reading it with a critical eye because it was so controversial at the time and being really surprised that he did build, it seemed to me in my recollection, this was some years ago now, but he, he did build to spend a lot of time building into the article perspective to make sure that people knew that this was a relatively narrow instance, um, a, you know, a, a narrow outcome of people who transition. And I was actually very surprised by that because of how much controversy there was around the article. So I'm curious, Nathan, I mean, do you, do you feel like the issue with, say, Jesse is that he's written about this issue too much and now you're just skeptical of his motives or that there was an actual problem with how things were framed in that initial article. People's criticism of him was, why are those things the caveats rather than the, rather than the focus? Right? Well, why, why do you pick these cases in which of, of, of regret to focus a lot on then build in all these caveats? Um, I have a long, I have a long sort of dissection of, so, of some of his. Uh, right. I know that I, I, I get the sense that he is a person who thinks he is handling these things sensitively. But then when you read a lot of the criticism of his work by trans writers, um, I, I think some of it holds up, where they say that he draws too much attention to certain aberrational cases and then loses sight of what the primary issue here um, actually is. Isn't that the same argument that's you know, being made for Glenn? Sorry, go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, no, I was I, I was going to say, Brie, you know, actually, th this this is a, a very familiar argument to me because, um, well, in 2016, for example, when we were covering the revelations of the WikiLeaks materials, 
um, and the things that it reflected about Hillary Clinton. We tried very hard to be careful to avoid gossipy items or things that were kind of trivial. But the more important things about the DNC cheating, about Hillary's speeches and what she told Goldman Sachs, what it reflected about her character and the like, we were publishing those. And the argument that we heard was not this isn't newsworthy or that what you're saying is inaccurate. It's that there's way too much emphasis on the flaws of Hillary Clinton, given how much greater the flaws are of the person against whom she's running. And that by surfacing it in this way, you're creating an imbalanced picture of the the respective flaws of, of the two candidates. And I think that I actually do think that a lot of these differences come down to the question of journalism. You know, like I have heard in the case of like detransitioners, for example, you can just go online and you can um, listen to their stories and they're they're horrible. You know, they're they're people who got convinced by healthcare workers or online spaces to be misdiagnosed as something that they weren't, which was trans and in a lot of cases undertake permanent life altering treatments, whether it's hormonal or even surgical, and then they decide that they wish they hadn't done it. It's just as harrowing to hear, you know, stories of people who have gender dysphoria who can't get treatment because they're afraid of their parents or their culture or because the medical profession is biased against them. And as journalists, I feel like our responsibility should be to tell interesting, meaningful, important stories that are true provide all that information to the public and ultimately leave it to like activists and the public to decide where they stand. If, you know, I I mean, there's, there's certainly no shortage of pro trans articles in the liberal press. You can pick up the Huffington post or Buzzfeed or the New York Times, any of them any week. And you're going to find articles about the, difficulties that trans people face. I doubt that there were very many people who even knew that there was such a thing as detransitioners before Jesse's article or Katie Herzog's article on The Stranger or the 60 Minutes um, article. So I think that a lot of this does come from what we expect journalism to be. And a lot of times there is this expectation. Bree's example of what happened to Lee Fong is a perfect example where journalists are, are viewed as having done something wrong if they surface information that can impede a political goal that people think is important. It's one of the reasons why people were so angry at me for denying Russiagate because they viewed it as an important weapon to use against Trump and the Republicans. And it looked as though I was serving the right, which was the the kind of framing of, of Nathan's article, serving the right wing. As journalists, we are going to sometimes serve the right wing, even if we're not on the right. We're going to do that if liberals say something that's false and we say so. Or they do something corrupt and we report that. So I do think that sometimes a lot of this does come down to what we view as our function in society. This, this, this is really interesting, actually, because I think I do actually differ with you on whether journal, the job of a journalist is just to, to neutrally go like, here are some facts if I spend my time and all of the things that I happen to write about are s- stories of like grotesque crimes committed by black people against white people, these are facts. I tell you the facts. What you do with these facts is uh, up to you. I think that is an abdication of the responsibility of journalists to care about how their stories are used. And that's not meaning you should bury the truth. I think that you've got to report on things that are important and true, but I also think that if it's the case that framing things one way is going to give an impression that is then going to lead to a bunch of legislation to try and deal with a problem that does not not exist, but is being blown out of proportion and is being blown out of proportion partially because journalists just tell stories as if all stories are equally representative. Are, are the stories um, of detransitioners... Then I think a journalist has a job to be political. Yeah, Nathan, but I think it's a the, caricature of the argument. Right. And, and of course, like, go are, ahead, Bree. Are the stories of transitioners important and true in the example that you just gave? Is that something that somebody has a right or is there a, a, a community interest in reporting on? 
every every human story is important. So then we're right? now, but now we're in the place when I brought up the Jesse Single article. You said, why is he writing an article about that and caveating it instead of writing the article about people who can't transition? Well, to me, that seems in conflict with what you just said, because if you think it's relevant to report on issues that are true, the stories of detransitioners are true. And I think that your obligation to your point, Nathan, would be to make sure that it's not weaponized in a way that's inappropriate because I think I'm somewhere between you and Glenn and to caveat in exactly the way Jesse tried to do now you should you could say he should have caveated more or that he should write two articles about um, people who can't transition for every one article that he writes about a detransitioner or some kind of math that seems to even it out. But I think that there is a significant portion of folks who think that there should just be no article ever that acknowledges the existence of detransitioners or the Russiagate stuff or the fact that there are black people with conservative politics or whatever it is. Or who commit crime. That, look, and, look, and let me, let me, cause I just want to interject there. Cause I just want my, my position to be clear. Like, I, like Nathan, that extremist view that, that you described, like, hey, just like, this is a fact. Go make of it what you will. Like, hey, I'm like some, I'm just picking. I just happen to be picking, like, to decide to report on every story where like a black person kills a white person, but I'm not responsible if that ends up creating the perception that like black people are more violent and white people are victims. No, I do not agree with that at all. That is not my framework whatsoever. I think that when I say that, you have to surface the facts to create an accurate impression that requires things like proportionality and making sure that you're not leaving a misleading impression by choosing things that are extremely aberrational and presenting them as common. I remember during the war on terror, it was very common, like right-wing bloggers like Charles Johnson would have, sort of like Breitbart has a black on black crime section, would have like a religion of peace uh, part of his blog and all he would do is like take little excerpts from like when a Muslim would engage in violence but never report on when Christians did or Jews did or when Muslims were victims of violence and that is incredibly deceitful right because you're creating an inaccurate perception of the world because of political activism but on the other hand it wouldn't be responsible for a news outlet or a commentator to deny that those things exist or to attack people who are reporting on those things like that Muslims actually do sometimes commit violence in the name of their religion, like other people in the name of their religions do. And I think that's what maybe Bree is getting at. And that, that th sometimes it does feel like people want journalism to be about exclusively serving a political agenda. And they get angry if you end up reporting things that undermine that agenda, regardless of whether or not it's true and reportable. And what's funny is that I actually think that like, I will be very honest about the fact that I started writing because I, I do have a political agenda, right? Like <laughs> I didn't leave my yeah, well paid law job because I just was like, you know, neutral. Like I was galvanized by 2016. I saw these arguments that weren't being made. I wanted to write, right? But I, my personal belief, and I think this also comes from having a lawyer's background, is that when I see an inconvenient fact, I want to grapple with it head on. Because I know what's going to come up. You know, opposing counsel is not a dumb dumb. It's going to come up. And the best I can do is try to frame it in the best in, in the best way. So my inclination is to say, someone's going to talk about detransitioners. I'd rather it be someone who's going to put it into the proper context and treat people sensitively and not use it as a cudgel against trans people who do want to transition on our very, the overwhelming majority who are incredibly happy with their choice. I, you know, I, I want to talk about, I want to acknowledge the fact that there are these complexities of viewpoints that are held among black Americans. Cause when you don't do that, you end up being surprised like boo boo the fool when South Carolina happens or when Eric Adams happens and everyone on the left just says, Oh, black people are dumb and they don't get it. Instead of actually engaging what's going on with, with communities and wrestling with how you pull a Buffalo and figure out how to talk to a community using the language that resonates instead of just writing them off because you never actually wrestled with these questions as a broader left community. Sorry, I don't mean to <laughs> sorry, get on my, my hobby horse. I agree with this. I mean, I spend a lot of time like trying to, I'm trying to write an article right now about how the left should talk about murder, for instance. 
because I think unless we are able to talk about how you deal with murder in a society, then when the murder rate goes up, it's going to be very, very difficult because there are going to be some people going, look at the murder rate, we need more police. And if we don't have a clear left response that goes, well, here's how you can have meaningful public safety without you know, growing the size of the police state, um, we're going to be unpersuasive. So I think we're probably on the same page for the most part about this. And yet there still seems to be this dissonance when it comes to certain issues that are these really hot button issues. I mean, I, I know there are going to be a lot of people who are very frustrated that I offered any even very caveated defense of Jesse Single in the context of this episode. And this could be the end. <laughs> well, but, but Brie, but Brie, let me let me let me just like I think I think this is a, a, like a really important issue. And just let me like underscore it, because this is something I do grapple with a lot is. You know, I am somebody who is like, I grew up in a working class neighborhood. My mom was, you know, like a single mother. She worked at hourly jobs. But since I left, you know, when I was 18, I've been ensconced in elite institutions on the East Coast. I was, you know, uh, 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 I went to a prestigious law school. I was working at a prestigious law firm. I worked as a lawyer in New York and Manhattan. And I lived in Rio de Janeiro for the last 15 years. I'm aware that I am separated from, in terms of my experience, the experience of most people, even though, you know, I have things that bring me into contact with, with people, we have charities and our shelter that works with the homeless people. It's still not the same when your life experience is nonetheless removed. And I try and be very aware of that. And I, I, I had this experience once, um, I went to, I I've written about this before. I went to dinner with two journalists who, um, are very kind of, uh, well established, they're well known, they have had a very successful career, they're very protected. And both of them um, live in kind of liberal enclaves, and each of them have teenage children, both of whom were dating. Um, one of who had a best friend who was a trans boy, the other was dating a trans boy. And the 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 journalist whose whose daughter was dating a trans boy had the the trans boy had actual top surgery, had a, a mastectomy and poses on Instagram with his shirt off. And they were both saying, I really wonder whether kids at the age of 15, 16, 17 are emotionally equipped to make these kind of choices that are so permanent, whether it's hormones or whatever. And we had a really interesting conversation about it that, you know, I talked about how I knew I was gay when I was 11. So why is it so like unclear that or hard to believe that somebody might know that they're trans when they're 14 or is that something different? Like it was a very honest, like interesting discussion. And then when I left, I realized that there would never ever be a moment where those two, despite how protected and well-established they are, would ever express those questions or uncertainties because the climate in which they work, which is liberal, the liberal sector of journalism would never permit it. They would be subject to all kinds of accusations. And I think that if you go and you know, look at polling data, so often the conversations that we're allowed to have on the elite liberal level as journalists or activists or whatever have rules that prescribe them that are completely different than the conversations that other people are having, which is why, you know, that video that Lee uploaded was so shocking to a lot of people, even though you polling shows that that's a view that a lot of people share, including in African-American neighborhoods who want more policing and not less, which is why you can't find anyone on Twitter who likes Eric Adams. And yet Eric Adams won fairly easily. And so I do grapple with that a lot that like, are we having these very insulated conversations and are these rules that we all live under this kind of regime of what we are and aren't allowed to say, leading to this greater and greater cleavage between ourselves, someone who went to Harvard, someone who went to Yale, someone who has had my life and still does, and the vast majority of the rest of the population. And I think there's lots of indicia that that cleavage is growing in a way that's really harmful and disturbing. Th this question of who has kind of won the culture wars and you know, what we are are allowed or are not allowed to say in quotation marks. I mean, I feel like this is another big division point where I think that some on the left, Nathan, I, you might be one of these, although I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, kind of push back against the idea that 
there's any sort of, for lack of a better word, cancel culture. Um, they push back against the idea that the left has any really real power. Um, and, I, and I've heard you make this argument, Nathan, that obviously the overwhelming force of power is behind the right or at least aligned behind corporate interests that tend to align with the right disproportionately, although certainly equal party access there. Um, and that it can feel, again, disproportionate to talk about, you know, the left's culture power when that's such a drop in the bucket of broader power. And I think that, that there's some legitimate legitimacy to that at the same time that it's also true that there are spaces, even if they're limited and ultimately less powerful, in which there are very strict cultural rules that can be policed in a way that can feel very powerful if you step aside them. And you can say it doesn't matter that Glenn can go and do a sub stack and everybody can go about their business and you're not actually really canceled. And I think that's that's fair. But whatever you want to call it, there certainly is a pressure not to discuss certain things. And maybe you think it's good that nobody should discuss Jesse Single and that's a, a net benefit for everyone. But if I'm going to be really honest, there have been moments on this show where, you know, you know, we have had conversations that were supportive, light, fun conversations that like touched upon an issue that we knew was going to be polarizing, like trans issues that we've just decided to cut because it wasn't worth it. And this is two people who support every right in the world for trans people who want them to have universal health care so that they can transition without cost, who want to respect pronouns and for everyone to live their best life, but who feel like there's so much heat <laughs> that it's well, not even worth opening the door. You, I think that this conversation that we just had is going to be extremely polarizing. You don't think it's going but, to? But what do you think the consequences for you are. I think I'm going to be called, I could conceivably be called a transphobe for the rest of my life on the internet. And you can see that's not a big consequence and I shouldn't care, but I think that that's also not really fair. <laughs> yeah, but, but let me, I mean, but let me, let, let me just, people but, criticizing you. Yeah, no, but I, Nathan, I, but let me just, but, 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 the, <laughs> but you, but we're, we're not, we're not representative. Like no one can fire Bree. Nobody can fire me. Nobody can fire Nathan. Most people don't have that luxury. So if Bree's reputation is torn to shreds because of something she says, she'll still have her podcast. She'll I mean, still be sort fine. Of also. But the like signal that certain, sends yeah. to like, yeah, like imagine like you're a reporter at Huffington Post or BuzzFeed or Vice or the New York Times or wherever, and you see jobs disappearing and you know you work in an industry where it's extremely difficult to keep your job, let alone to get a new one if you get fired. You're going to look at that and you're going to know that there's a big price to pay for questioning liberal pieties at all. I can't tell you how many times during Russiagate I had journalists from like CNN or the Washington Post or NBC DM me or email me and say, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. I wish I could do it, but I know that I can't. So the fact that there are some people like us who are insulated because we have independent platforms who will just we'll get called names insulated. and have reputational arms, <laughs> it's a way of sending a signal to people who are much more vulnerable that, okay, maybe they end up on their feet, but you won't. It's easy to dismiss that, but if you're not somebody at risk of it, but I think that, you know, it's, it's a big problem for a lot of people. The point that I usually make on this is that for exactly the reasons that you stated kind of earlier, which is that these places with discursive rules that are kind of strict are a very narrow segment of society and divorced from the what the majority out there thinks, right? And they're sort of detached. Focusing on the way those rules in those spaces occur uh, misses the fact that for the most part, we are still in a world in which bigotry isn't in fact punished and that actually that in in from in most of the world for instance um it is not the parent who worries about their child's gender transition being too fast and they can't say it who is the person who can't speak but it is the child who can't say, tell the truth about their gender identity to their parents because they'll be disowned or hurt. Um, and that those, I mean, I read uh, Abigail Schreier's book and I, I, I reviewed it, Irreversible Damage, uh, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. 
And one of the very obvious things about it is that she gives a lot of attention to the parents who are worried about their children's gender transitions, and the children themselves are totally absent from the book, and those are the people that I, most of my concern is with, because I actually think that generally, if your speech is in support of conventional wisdom, which still tends towards uh, prejudice and still tends towards reactionaryism, the outside of certain spaces where the left has in fact managed to perhaps overcorrect slightly, um, most of the time people are pretty fine. And all of these right-wing speakers have best-selling books, usually, you know... Uh, but, but Nathan, uh, we're like, not talking about right-wings. We're, we're literally just in this context talking about me me and what may or may not happen, what the response might be to me on this podcast. And your response is to say that it's it's it would be fine, hypothetically, if I had known for the tra as a transphobe for the rest of my life, for the, some tepid statements about whether or not one article written by Jesse Single five years ago was accurately criticized. That's what we're talking about here. And and to the to just a brief point of correction, his article, whatever you might say about it, and I'm overly happy to hear all the substantive critiques from any trans, you know, authority who wants to come and talk on here. I've read a lot of them because I'm genuinely wanting wanting to understand and have been wanting to know for years. But his focus in that article was on kids. There were interviews with kids or people who had t d d who had transitioned young. Right. That wasn't a story about the parents. So so the question is, are we just not, you know, should he just no? should no one write about that? Oh, and I like, should, at no point have I said nobody should write about it. Well, so then so the, what what is the claim? Like the, this is the part that why, why can't we acknowledge that there are areas that are sensitive for good reason, right? They're, sen they're, they're sensitive areas because there has been so much one sidedness and so much difficulty placed on the marginalized party on trans kids, on vic black victims of gun violence and police violence, on the, 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 the Hillary, Russia, all of that. You know, that it's so one-sided that we are reluctant to raise our hand and say, draw any attention to what might be a, little legit a legitimate concern on the other side. Oh, Trump is so bad. Okay, I, I get it. But can't we have both things? Like, why is there this binary where it is presumed that acknowledging that someone somewhere might have regretted a decision can't be put in the proper context that doesn't isn't used to to weaponize um, isn't weaponized against people who want to transition? And I think that your critique of Glenn, I think, in some respects, is is, is strongest here, where you say there are times when Glenn doesn't caveat enough. There's times when it's not clear when, where Glenn's politics actually lie because he doesn't push back against Glenn Beck or Tucker Carlson in the way that he should. And we can have a conversation about where that line is and what the cost benefit is of Glenn not pushing back in order to get a bigger, broader message across or when, and as a matter of principles and ethics, he needs to draw a line more clearly. I think that that's, that's a legitimate place of disagreement. But where I can't get down with you is this idea that, and, and I, I want you to try to maybe articulate what you're saying here. You know, when is it that someone can write the piece about the controversial thing without being called a transphobe or some other label that I think that probably doesn't fit. And why is it that it's you, you ha seemingly have a blasé attitude about the idea that someone, let's say, in my position right now might get stuck with that label? Why is that just like, like OK? I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying play the, the biggest the world's tiniest violin for me. Hardly, I'm not the victim in the situation, obviously, and who knows what the response will even be. But like a basic acknowledgement, like yeah, that would that would suck. <laughs> it, it's it's odd to me. Yeah. So one of the frustrations that I I've read in pieces by trans writers about the way the detransition conversation happens. Yeah. Is the suggestion that oh. You don't want us to ever mention that detransition happens. You want to bury it. And what writers say is, well, no. In fact, we discuss detransition. It's something that has, in fact, been discussed. You just don't read our writings on the topics. And instead, in fact, a lot of my writing on social, social justice issues, one of the things that I see as a common frustration is people being called censorious and, you know, woke authoritarians 
without necessarily being listened to and having their critiques taken seriously. And I am of the belief that there is some overreaction, some kind of willingness to to call names casually, and that I don't like it when you know uh, cruelty is exercised on the internet. I'm very, very opposed to it. Um, but that also, like, if people do handle issues genuinely sensitively and they research and they care and they listen and they show their pieces to the people affected and go, do you think this comes across a little badly? Is there some way I can improve this? Um, then the controversy tends to die down. A lot of people who get like really attacked on the internet are people who come at it with an extremely confident approach, which is like, I'm voicing the un-PC opinions that nobody wants to hear and you all just want to call me names and fuck you. Is right? that how and you feel me, Jesse's that behaved? exacerbates the problem. Is that how you feel Jesse's behaved? I, I do kind of feel that way, yeah. Can, can I interject here? Because I, first of all, I think it's I, I think it's a super interesting conversation, the whole thing about like, hey, as long as you're like still standing and you're not like in prison and you're not starving to death in a gutter, like what do you really have to complain about just because people criticize you? Like, remember what happened with Lee Fong, which was one of his colleagues called him a racist in response to that video. And I would say that hundreds of major media figures chimed in in defense of that accusation against him, supporting the idea that he's actually a white supremacist or a racist in all sorts of ways, retweeting that, liking it. I think it got 8,000 retweets, 35,000 likes, but major, major voices in the profession in which he works manifested in defense of that accusation against him. No, he still had a job after that. He was still allowed to like tweet. But the reputational injury is extremely important. We're all social and political animals. And when you get widely branded as a racist in an unfair way, I think we should not be so dismissive of that. Um, that's the one thing. The other thing is, I think, you know, I think there's this odd uh tendency on the part of all of us and i'm put myself in this i think it's like a human nature i think it's part of our tribalism that we always like to think that it's always the other side that has all the power and we have almost none so in like nathan's telling the idea that you know like a pro trans viewpoint is like so rarely expressed that it's like this kind of forbidden minority idea, the reality is, is that pretty much like every major powerful institution routinely expresses defense of trans rights. Like Joe Biden, you know, just will tweet like trans, trans women are women or whatever. The CIA, the FBI, all those like controversies that people have talked about where they're embracing these kind of, you know, liberal cultural war agendas, which doesn't mean those causes are wrong because the CIA is exploiting them. But the fact that like major corporations like Citibank will tweet or put on their Instagram the trans flag signifies where the real power lies within these cultural war debates. Well, Glenn, I, I'm again, I'm somewhere between you guys. Like, uh, I, I I wouldn't over. Date that right because there's all kinds of and Nathan you made this point in your article I think very well there are people who will appropriate certain imagery and kind of superficially support various causes. Well, um, why are they doing that? Why does that work? Why does it work for Citibank or DCA no, I, to appropriate it? I, I agree with you, Glenn, that they're they're capitalizing on certain cultural trends that indicate that maybe some cultural victories have been won and the Overton windows have shifted, etc. But it's a very superficial kind of commitment, as we can see when Joe Biden immediately starts his, you know, second crime bill r ratcheting up, <laughs> as he's doing right now, right after saying that he wouldn't have won without black people. And who knows what may or may not happen with respect, with respect to the LGBT community. He certainly doesn't support, um, you know, Medicare for all, which would have been a real boon for so many folks who can't afford uh, gender reaffirming surgery, gender affirming surgery and all of that kind of thing. Um, right, but like he reversed the ban on like trans people in the military, like I think in the first week. So sure. it's not all just empty gestures. Sh sure, but to me, the th I, I follow I follow capital, and to me, people are going to be willing to do all kinds of things right up to the line of when it actually affects capital, the the donor class, the 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 special interest. And this is what I was saying a little bit to David Sirota in last week's episode. He was saying, "Well, Republicans, capital doesn't really care about voting rights," and I'm like. Mm -hmm. 
will know if the voting rights shift the balance of power such that they're not able to get their agenda across as easily. I think they care. It is one step removed from some of the more specific bills. But, you know, so so I agree with that. But, but Glenn, I, where I will agree with you is that I would say that there are just certain spaces. You know, every space isn't equal. We're not, there's the entire globe where I would say that trans rights are very much not protected. Right. There's America right, sure. where it's a little bit better. There's places like New York and Massachusetts and San Francisco where it's a lot better. And it's sure. differs by household by household. And a different, we're in a lefty community. We're in a lefty political community. We're on Twitter, which skews left. You know, all of these things mean that there can be spaces in which there is a, quite a bit of cultural hegemonic power on the left. And there are spaces where they're not. And this whole conversation gets conflated into like, who has power? Oh, you're ignoring the fact that that's a right wing government and Trump almost did an insurrection and all this. Well, no, like obviously in some places that it's an enormous uphill battle for trans issues and other kinds of marginalized groups. But I think we can also acknowledge that most of us live in spaces where even having the kind of conversation we've had today is very thorny. I will concede that the left is winning the retweet wars. But I measure <laughs> trans rights by, for example, survey the surveys that are done of trans people in America about harassment, about housing discrimination, about workplace discrimination. I measure the success of Black Lives Matter by, for example, the wealth gap, by uh, housing discrimination. I don't measure the success of the labor movement by whether Amazon is tweeting like, we're the real Bernie Sanders, we love our workers, but what it actually looks in a, like in an Amazon fulfillment center. But Nathan, we're and not I talking about the success kind of, of those movements. We're, this, con this is a conversation about whether or not there are any power imbalances that make it more or less difficult to have certain kinds of conversations as journalists and public commentators. I don't think any of us would argue that trans rights have been won or Black Lives Matter is booming and successful or anything of the sort, or, or you know, labor rights are on the upswing or anything of the sort based on what's going on on the internet. One of my problems is that when we talk about power, a lot of it is like discursive power and then out in the world, Right, it's still a case that the United States is a country ruled by a form of brutal libertarian capitalism where there are still massive uh, racial uh, disparities across nearly every measure of health, housing, etc. Mm -hmm. And that, like, I want to reorient our conversation. And I think when we say, "Oh, well, the left is winning the the culture war," right, because th there's a lot of criticism of police in the discourse, but then as a, as a practical, real matter, police budgets just go up and up and up every year. Uh, we are getting kind of a false impression of who's really winning in the world of actual material power. This is just a small fraction of a two and a half hour epic conversation that we had with Nathan Robinson and Glenn Greenwald. You can listen to the rest of the conversation exclusively by subscribing to Bad Faith Patreon for $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash Look forward to seeing you over there. Mm -hmm.